that much. We're back live? Yes. And we're back live. So hopefully that resets the link and uh, stops the problems. But Andrew, that last video, even though it was choppy, yep. you look kind of cold. Yeah. And that was a pretty mm -hmm. tight sweater yeah. you were wearing. I know. So uh, I came there at 7 in the morning a little ill-prepared. So I had to borrow David, who's behind the camera's uh, jacket, uh, because I'd been bottling all summer and didn't realize how cold it had been in the morning. <laughs> so, but um, but it's, you know, it's, it's a neat, neat little... Um, thing to see because you know 7 a.m. the fog burned off by about 9 a.m. Um, but I, I spent the rest of the day in shorts and a polo and it was plenty warm um, so it was it was chilly to start though yeah, yeah. <laughs> it looked like it it was so cold you froze the camera I know so I know. basically see, it wouldn't be harvest without some sort of challenge you know it's harvest season and so you, you get you get through it and you, you find, it. find a solution isn't you know, it you know the internet couldn't handle you Andrew at Patriots it was just overload Andrew Chardonnay too it was much. too heavy of a yeah. feed they say but you, you can see you've all got your, your Napa Valley winemaker uniforms on shorts yep. polo and work boots right now it's a little warm yeah it is warmer than Patriots that day, though. It, yes, certainly. <laughs> yeah, but it, it's 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 nice. You know, we're, we're just probably upper 80s right now. Yeah, feeling pretty good in where we are. Patriots is a, a pretty special vineyard for us. You know, Rombau has lots of different that uh, lots of different vineyards that span the length and breadth of Napa Valley as well as Sonoma and then Sierra foothills. But Patriots was one of those few vineyards that we developed from scratch. So we had bare land that we purchased, and we did the there was no existing vineyard. So. It's actually one of the only vineyards we've ever been able to develop completely from scratch. It's a unique and, thing uh, to see. It was pretty fun. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I really loved it. It's, a, it's our largest estate vineyard. It's 100% Chardonnay, and yeah, it was. No, it's yeah, neat. It's a like real blank experience. canvas and trying to figure out what what will work best from all the knowledge that you had attained from that previous you know decade of experience, two decades yes. at the time maybe. So, so yeah. we should probably talk about the 2021. Chardonnay in our glass. It yeah, was yeah. pretty delicious because yeah. I had to refill myself up. <laughs> the, but, the wine glass up. But Andrew, um, talk us through the 2021 vintage. So it was a, yeah. a relatively warm year. Yeah. Uh, but pretty but no spaced real, out. Yeah, no real inclement weather, um, no big heat spikes. So we had this, you know, longer growing season so we could really pick the fruit at the optimal ripeness. There was no, um, you know, big weather pattern coming in. We could just string it out until we really found that the acid and the flavors were right in balance. Um, so we made these beautifully balanced, naturally balanced wines um, with great intensity. And really when you, you know, you, you smell it, you get to taste it, and you're seeing those classic components of Rombard Chardonnay. You know, we had that ripe fruit, the, you know, stone fruit, the citrus that's coming from Carneros. Yeah. Um, that's just supplied by the, the, the fruit, the growing conditions. We get a creamy mid palate on the wine from, you know, Lee's stirring. Um, a little buttery note from malolactic fermentation. There's... Vanilla, that's right. uh, just a touch of spice from the, the uh, from the oak, which I, I, I really yeah. love. It's like the accents to those fruit flavors, um, and then it's all held to get together by this beautiful natural acidity, and it makes this wine of you know impeccable balance, fruit intensity, depth, concentration, and it really just hits on each one of those little points. Yeah. So right now, Andrew, you know this, it's very fresh, very citrusy, very tropical. Like it's just been bottled mm -hmm. and released. How, how's that going to evolve over like? say Thanksgiving time. Yeah, so especially towards the holidays, you know, we, we like to think when that, whenever we bottle the wines, you know, a little bit more tightly wound, um, you know, that buttery, creamy mid palate, it's a little bit more suppressed, so the wine has a little bit more citrus expressed. Um, you know, the stone fruits are still there, but they're just not at the forefront. Um, the buttery component's more of an accent as well, and that will become more and more expressive. But really around that, you know, four to six month window, it starts to get you know, a lot rounder, richer, um, that the buttery component really expresses itself. Um, and you get those, you know, truly, when you think of classic Montbert yeah. Chardonnay, you get that true expression. Yeah. Right now it's there, it just needs a little bit more coercing. Um, maybe, you know, in the glass for a little bit longer, a little bit warmer temperature, not serving it too cold is always important. Yeah. Um, and, and it's a really expressive Chardonnay. But I think at this point, it's, it's showing, you know, Beautifully, it's a little more fleshy and round than the 2020 when we right. first bottled it. So, and, and I think it's I think it's evolved better right now at this point. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thanks, for that, Andrew. All right, well, time for more wine, not just the classic Chardonnay. We have some special ones too. Our reserve lineup. Let's talk about uh, Buckley Station. Let me get some of that in your glass. Yep. Um, Let's go. We'll 
water the garden behind us. So, Andrew, tell yeah. us a little about about Buckley Station. Where is it? So how did it get its name? Why is it so special to us? Yeah, so it's. A, I mean, for us internally as a winemaking team, it's incredibly special because it, it's such a core component of not only the classic Rombert Chardonnay, but also, of course, the Buckley Station. Um, it, it's this incredible site at the southern end of Napa Carneros. It's actually you know, one of the most southern vineyards, um, but it, it always retains beautiful acidity. It has a brightness and a fret freshness to the fruit. Um, and the site has such cool little history. You know, it used to be a, a train station um, between the Napa and Sonoma uh, growing regions for the Bay Area. Um, and then back in the 50s, it was actually like a classified relay station to track Sputnik. Um, so Russian satellite. We were always wa watching them. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, in Australia, we were like, do 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 do. Better keep mining. But yeah, it's a. Uh, but no, it's a, it's a really neat vineyard, um, and and it's just it, it provides such a you know the, the acidic backbone for a classic Chardonnay as well. Yeah, it's, it's a, also it's our a, second largest estate Chardonnay vineyard. Yeah, I mean it's it, it, and it has such varying ages of vines that it, you can build depth by looking at these different blocks planted in different decades, back from you know the 80s all the way up to the mid 2000s. Yeah, you probably love this vineyard too, Andrew, don't I you? I love it like it. Like, yeah, I know. Like I, your I, only I child. love all the vineyards. Yeah, it's like my only child. I love her. <laughs> well, uh, Richie, you went out to Buckley Station. I you did. Know, should we have a look at that too? Yeah, let's have a look at the video. <laughs> Hi, I'm Rich Allen, the Vice President of Viticulture and Winemaking for Rumbauer, and today we are down at our Buckley Station vineyard on the Napa side of Canaris. This is actually the southernmost vineyard in the Napa Valley. And you can see behind me the salt plains that lead in the San Pablo Bay. And it's effectively where the Napa Valley ends. We have about 60 acres of Chardonnay down here, planted between 1989 and 2006. There's a bunch of different blocks. Some of these go into our Buckley Station Chardonnay. A little bit goes into our proprietor's reserve, but most of the blocks end up in our classic Carnero Chardonnay. Buckley Station is all about acidity. And despite being on the Napa side of Canaris, which is a little bit warmer than the Sonoma side, it does ripen a fraction earlier. But when we're looking to pick, we want to make sure that we have full phenolic ripeness and flavor in the grapes so they taste good while still retaining acidity because that's what gives the white wine its structure. When we decide to pick here at Buckley, we're looking for this flavor ripeness and acid balance in the grapes. Once we know it's there and that's all done by taste, we make the decision to harvest. Everything here is hand harvested at night. It arrives at the winery very early in the morning when the grapes are still cool. That helps us retain freshness in the wine. And from there, it's gently pressed. That gentle pressing allows us to extract the highest quality free run from the grapes. We then cold soak overnight before going the barrel. And with Buckley, we tend to use a slightly lower portion of new oak, but a heavier portion of French oak, which is more subtle on the wine. From there, it goes through fermentation and malactic fermentation, and then we we age it in barrel for about nine months with wheat stirring. Tim wines have this vibrant citrus lime character to them, a lot of lemon, but what's really unique about Buckley is this saline quality or fresh sea breeze that you often see in the wine. Buckley Station is one of my favorite places in the Napa Valley. This is usually where I start my day during harvest as the sun comes up. Uh, I've been walking these blocks for almost 20 years now and it makes a wine that uh, I truly love. So I hope you guys enjoy it as much as I do. Oh, all right, we're back. Well, <laughs> thanks, Richie. All right, that was awesome, mate. Uh, but tell us, what makes Buckley so unique to you? You mentioned briefly a little bit. Um, well, it's at the it's at the southern tip of the Napa Valley, where the Napa Valley ends. So if you come down the valley, the last vineyard before you hit the Salt Plains and Pablo Bay is Buckley. It's a couple of unique soils. There's a bit of uh, hair clay, hair clay loam, but in a couple of spots, there's this hair clay loam that has higher rock content, more gravel. Uh, those are the sections of the vineyard tend to ripen earlier. You know, Andrew mentioned that we have a bunch of different uh, age vines down there with different vine age. So there's, you know, everything from plantings in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, and those different vine ages, different clones. It gives depth. But I think what I love about it is it's usually one of the first vineyards we start picking. Yeah. It's one of our largest state vineyards, so it's it's one of the core vineyards for our classic Chardonnay, and you know, it's truly unique in its uh, fruit profile yet still high quality. And that's that's why we make a single vineyard wine from it. That's right. Yeah, that's you right. know what I, I always love is when I, I'm tasting it, I always think of like purity of fruit and it has this really cleansing, like you know how like, rainwater has like a cl really clean kind of sensation? It has that really clean sensation of pure citrus fruit. It's a very yeah. pure wine. It's, yeah. uh, 
you know, on the palate, it's always higher. It's the higher acids of all the Chardonnays that we make. Um, mm -hmm. And that purity, I always say it has a saline quality to it, like freshly shucked oysters. Right. And it's more of a citrus, citrus component. So when, you know, in the classic Chardonnay, you have a lot of peach, but that bright citrus component you see in the wine, well, the classic Chardonnay when it's young comes from Buckley Station, and it's just, I mean... It's, no, it, it's, it's fantastic. such a neat wine. I, I really, what I really love is, you know, um, when, you, when you're looking at these different vineyards, Buckley for me really stands out because it's the one that you, it, it's really susceptible to being over-oaked really quickly. Very much and so, so, you always yeah. have to be very mindful of the oak you're putting into it. So, you, you know, you don't want high impact because it has these really, you know, pure flavors, you know, almost a delicacy to it yep. with, with high acid intensity. Um, and so you don't want to overwhelm it. And so you want things that complement and build out that structure of the acid. Um, and so it's, it's something that's, you know, not, not challenging, but it's definitely taken a hand of time to learn what works so best. When choosing these barrels, they go into this, are they new barrels or using older barrels? So I generally a little bit less new barrels. So I, I really love one year old, one once used French barrels, um, a little bit lower impact. They really frame out the wine. They tend to be fruit. lower toast barrels yeah, as well. Using this wine, you know, yeah. longer toasts yeah. that really like lengthen the wine, um, give it that back end structure that we love. Um, so it's always it's it's such a neat wine and, and such a you know um, a way to play off of the classic Chardonnay. I'm just laughing because someone made a comment about uh, uh, where is it uh, something about Pinot, and we don't make a Pinot. No. Sorry. But Chardonnay, it's a complimentary. Plenty of Chardonnay. Com complimentary. Sorry. Interesting comment to make. We'll come back to that later. <laughs> but mm, uh, another yeah. another comment, uh, someone asked a question uh, about uh, Joy, our Betrayed Chardonnay. Are we making another one? We did make one, and we'll get to that later <laughs> in the show. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. but, yeah, I mean, Buckley, it's one of two single vineyard Chardonnays we make. Luke, we also make another uh, Chardonnay, Home Ranch Chardonnay. Um, this comes... Like, you know, I said Buckley is a very special place for me. It's usually where I start my days during harvest. But yep. Home Ranch, it's uh, the Chardonnay vineyard we've been working with the longest of all of our Chardonnay vineyards. And it's a, it's a pretty amazing vineyard. And um, That's right. Wait. Yeah. Stop. I'm not going <laughs> to. <still like Dunga. laughs> That's your, my vineyard I went to. I went there. Have a look. Yeah. It's my favorite. Luke, it's, Luke's Home Ranch. It is. It's, <laughs> it's luscious and round and delicious. So let's go to the video and have a look. Hi guys, I'm Luke Clayton, winemaker at Rombauer Vineyards, and I'm at the Home Ranch Vineyard on the Sonoma side of Canaris. This vineyard here is owned by the San Giacomo family, a long time uh, farming family who purchased this property almost 100 years ago. Our partnership with the San Giacomo family is the longest growing relationship we have. We've been purchasing fruit from the San Giacomo family for over 20 years, and their partnership is so vital and important to our Rombauer Chardonnay. We are very far west, almost as far west as you can go and still be in the Canaris AVA. Right here in the home ranch, we're actually in a very cool spot. So this fruit is some of the last fruit that comes in every harvest. These particular vineyard blocks were planted in 1982, which you can tell by looking at the vines. As the grapevine gets older, they get thicker and gnarlier. So just by taking a quick look, you can roughly judge the age of a vineyard. As a vineyard gets older, uh, the quality of fruit we get from it goes up, but the yields tend to go down over time. The berries we get from these vines are more concentrated, which produce more wines of intensity, richness, which you can definitely taste in the Chardonnay, which comes from here. We make a single vineyard wine here, aptly called Home Ranch Chardonnay. And then some of the fruit goes into our proprietor selection, while the remaining goes into our classic Canera Chardonnay. The fruit has ripe yellow peach, dry straw flavors, and with a body which is voluptuous and round. It is a very textural and deep Chardonnay, both with it expressed as a single vineyard and an added component to our blend. Personally, one of my favorite wines we make here, and for you guys to try it. Man, and you know, I, I love that vineyard too. <laughs> you know, I, you know, I really like <laughs> but what I really love is, you know, Luke, even with the branded sunglasses. I know. I mean, where, that, where do I even find this? I, I don't know. We have to ask marketing. Oh. There was a comment with, uh, why don't you have sunglasses on during the live stream while me and Andrew do, Luke? So where are your sunglasses? Oh, I put away because I couldn't see the screen. Yeah. <laughs> Those old eyes get them. They, they do. <laughs> we are having a little bit of trouble, guys, with the videos that are playing. Uh, they're getting a bit choppy and we're seeing comments. These will all be available afterwards on our YouTube channel. So you'll be able 
louder. Watch them again there. I know you can hear it, but we'll, yeah, a few little technical issues. But back yeah. to our home ranch. Yeah, so, you know, uh, Luke, in that video, you, you mentioned, Can I have you some know, wine? Yes, sorry. Yeah, well, well, first sorry. we better get wine in our glass. Um, but Luke vin mentioned uh, vineyard age, the impact of the quality of th the fruit, and really what um, those lower yields mean for the grapes and the resulting wines. Delicious, basically. So lower yields uh, is basically a, a smaller crop. So as the vines uh, get older and they, uh, uh, they, they naturally uh, become more restrictive and more um, self-sustaining, I guess, or self-restricting. So we get smaller clusters, less clusters per vine, but what I think is really important is uh, smaller berries. So when that happens and you have that uh, canopy, you have more energy going into ripening the grapes, so you get yeah. more flavor, and we end up with wines with more depth and concentration. But we should talk about this wine, the home yeah. ranch. Well, yeah. I, I think just going back to that like concentration issue is is it always reminds me of you know having a really mass-produced like peach at the grocery store. You know, it's it's plump, but it's watery. It's it, there's not much flavor behind it. But then you go to the farmer's market and you get you know these beautifully grown peaches. Um, they're they're a little bit smaller. They're they're juicy, but they have that concentration of flavor and intensity. And it's the same kind of thing I think of when I think of home ranch. It's like biting into a, a, a fresh peach, a fresh stone fruit. Um, and really, it's you know it's that that textural aspect. Yeah, there's me. a question here, Luke. I think you could probably answer really well. It says, how does the home ranch taste different from the classic Carnera Chardonnay? Could you describe that for the people at home? Yeah, right. Thanks, mate. Yeah, put so, you on the spot. <laughs> yeah, so Home Ranch, it's a lot more, um, it's more fatter and richer um, on the palate, um, more glycerol-y, um, especially, let's say first, the Buckley. The Buckley station is very more focused on my palate, a lot more acid-driven. Um, so, but basically these two single vineyards are basically the best aspects from each vineyard. So these are only like 20 to 20, uh, 20 to 30 barrels each year out of a bigger blend so it's a lot more intensity a lot more depth a lot more weight and then the length on the finish so um, after you you have a taste and then it comes back and says hello yes I'm still here <laughs> like that peach and yeah. mango and the, all those flavors from each ranch so it's, it's kind of neat but the beautiful thing is that these two uh, vineyards we've been dealing with a long time are actually core to our classic program this is just so, um, so it's interesting the best, if you blend yeah. the two together yeah. the buckley and the home ranch you end up with something that resembles a classic rombau chardonnay yes yeah because you have that that yin and yang of you know uh, a little bit higher acid more focused more citrus driven yeah and then you have this textural component of stone fruit um, you know richness and those two playing into each other really provide that balance of what we see in rombau chardonnay well i think that leads perfectly actually into it the does. next one yeah. which is our proprietor selection chardonnay so this is the the top of the top, um, it has components of home and Buckley and another vineyard in it and one or two others depending on the year. But proprietors is, uh, it's it's the best of what we can do. So it's, yeah. it really is a Well, it's only, a it's only produced wine. in like, truly exceptional vintages. Um, we, we are blessed in Napa to have, you know, North North Bay, or North Coast to have been blessed with some pretty good ones right in a row. Um, but this is truly the best barrels from the best lots of the year. Um, and hands down, there's no there's no pre-existing condition. We go through and, and and basically assess the best Chardonnay quality lots of the year. Well, my wife just appeared on the live stream and she said Rombau Chardonnay goes perfect with back to school. <laughs> it, it is. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. I think yeah. it get, I think it's gotten her through a lot of school. So Luke, yeah. can you explain to people when we're going through and we're making uh, the proprietor Chardonnay, the selection process of how we draw out these individual lots that come out of the classic Chardonnay? That we feel are better, and how we get to this process, and what well, lots this, are? First what of lots all. are? What lots? What lots are? No, what, what a lot is? Because oh I, yeah, yeah, we okay. say lots. <laughs> yeah, we say lots, and so it's it's. You are know, you making up words for me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, what a lot so, is? So uh, basically, when the fruit comes in and it comes across the weigh scale, um, it will get a number um, anywhere. Usually, we start at 600, 601, and sometimes we end up at 730. But each lot is basically a picking in that vineyard. Um, it can range from a barrel size from 20 barrels to 150 barrels and then we'll actually go and individually taste them and um, basically when we go through and taste them all we'll notice certain lots that have a bit more depth a bit more flavor um, than other lots and so we'll pull them aside and we'll go back to them later in a couple of weeks and we'll retaste those lots and then we'll narrow it down and then basically at a table like this we'll go through and we'll have our lots we might have 10 lots and we'll go through and make our blends 
and then we'll go into the cellar and we'll taste those individual barrels. Because each individual barrel, even though it could be the same lot, same toast, it's basically its own little village. And sometimes a village thrives and other times it's like, eh, it does okay. <laughs> and so we only pick those best ones to go into this, uh, the proprietor selection or our single vineyards. So the proprietor selection is actually core made up of home ranch and Buckley together with uh, a, a couple sprinkling of, of other vineyards. Yes, yeah, sprinkling yeah. of other and vineyards. And that's generally how it ends up. But I mean, it's never, you know, this year if you if you found a, like a better expression, it's truly just the best expressions, the best. best vineyards of the year. Yeah. And Andrew, that process that Luke described yep. in quite a lot of detail. How long does that take for us to get through that tasting so, to yeah, select so those barrels start, for those wines? We'll start in like say February and we'll go assess and taste through 130 to 160 lots depending on the year. We'll basically earmark lots that we think are of higher quality. So let's say after that tasting we go down to 25. We'll go back and reassess about a month later and then we'll we'll highlight our favorite lots again, retaste in a, about a month later again. And we whittle it down to about our ten, six to ten favorite lots. Um, and that's basically process describing is about three what we just described. I asked you yeah. how long it takes. No, but it's about it's about three months. <laughs> Thank it, you. Is, I was just going through the number process, so we got down to six to ten. Basically, you just said you're all. dribbling, Andrew. I did. I dribbling. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now, but we but we, we get about th you know three months in, and yeah. then we start pulling up each lot. And, and how does the proprietor Chardonnay differ? from the classic Chardonnay? I, I think it just expresses On the more, palate, I mean, flavor-wise. I'm seeing you know, more concentration and depth, and so you, you're getting this intensity on the palate, and you're getting a little bit more nuance, uh, like you know, those, those citrus oils, the oranges, you know, um, ripe white peaches, Calamal. yellow peaches. You're getting a little bit of play, of intensity, of the best aspects of truly these two vineyards, plus a little bit of others. It's interesting, um, when I do a, a Chardonnay panel, and we'll say we're doing a Rombau Chardonnay panel, and we'll do all the Chardonnays in a lineup, and we'll start with the, the classic Chardonnay, we do the Buckley, we do the Home Ranch, and we finish on the Prop. I always tell people, when it comes to the, the classic, and we start with that, don't finish your glass, because we're going to come back to it. And spend, you know, 40 minutes going through all the wines, and I always say to you, go back from the proprietors back to the classic Chardonnay, and people get this funny look on their face, and I'm like, it seems a bit light, doesn't it? It's not that you'd ever describe Rombau Chardonnay as light or thin, yeah. but it's just there's so much depth and concentration in that proprietors that it really does show you what we can do if we are- uh, On the highest level. At the highest level. And I, I think the biggest thing for me is, is the finish on the wine. I mean, it has a lingering sensation on the palate for like 60 seconds. Like it has such concentration that it, once you, you know, have your sip, you can still taste it for you know, a minute plus. Yeah. It's probably because your favorite vineyards go in there too. Probably, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I thought so. And I just want to give a quick shout out to uh, Tracy Beard Stone. Happy birthday. Um, I hope you're enjoying a bowl of Rombau Chardonnay. So, happy birthday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, that's enough wine for now. Now to my favorite part of the evening yep. is food. And uh, we have Alex Benson working behind the scenes. She's our resident culinary wizard. Um, culinary seen, expert. Yes, yep. <laughs> you've seen her here before last time um, uh, with our steak edition, which rocked. Um, but she didn't want to get on the camera today, so we have um, some pairings wow. to go with our Chardonnay today. So, Andrew, you chose the first pairing. Yes. You did a, a, an appetizer, an entree, and a dessert because we wanted to prove that Rombau Chardonnay can go with the beginning, the middle, and the end of any meal. And what did you uh, pair for an entree I, for the classic Rombau Chardonnay? I did this luscious baked brie. Looks pretty good. <laughs> <It does. laughs> you know, and I, when I was choosing it, it wasn't 95 degrees outside. Um, but, however, it's, it's right here, so it looks delicious. It does, actually. And while you're serving up, a quick question came in from Karen. Uh, she said, how do you keep the Rombau Chardonnay so consistent each year? Um, mm. Honestly, it's... Uh, <laughs> It's the same three jokers working together with the same team in the cellar as one part of it. But we generally work uh, with the same vineyards every year. We know very much stylistically the quality of wine and the style of wine we want to achieve. And because we're working with those same blocks every year, no matter what mother nature throws with us, we're able to adjust our vineyard practices and winemaking practices to achieve the style of wine, the quality especially, that we want. So it's working with the same vineyards every year adjusting our practices to make sure we can stylistically hit the style we want and then the same winemaking team same people same techniques and that's how we do it that's how we keep it consistent experience experience and yeah. and 
repetition, yeah. <laughs> for lack yeah. of a better term. That's cool. I'm very excited. I'm going to start eating, and hopefully they don't zoom in on me while I eat this time. We much, much right. appreciated, David. So I'm going to let. Uh, <laughs> who's going to go first? Oh, yeah, you guys eat, yeah. and then I'll. I'll uh, yeah, you, you waffle on. Some so sand. we've got a little uh, fruit rye cracker. Is it caramelized onion relish? Uh, Balsamic onion. Balsamic caramelized onion. Yes, let's go. And on. a baked brie. And Andrew's <laughs> tasting it and eating it first because he does that. I do jump so, right into it. Now you can talk about it while no, I so taste I, it. You know, especially with you know having prop, um, you know the acidity cutting through the creaminess of the of the brie, but the the fruit profile playing with you know the the puff pastry around it. It's, you know puff pastry and like rich chardonnay. I, I <laughs> love I love those flavors together. Um, you know it's like it's like squeezing like 14 different like stone fruits in there and then having it all together. It's it's very good. Yeah. Yeah. Good job, Alex. If you're back there. Wow, that's uh, that's really is that, good. That's good a, is that a phyllo pastry or puff pastry? Uh, I'm a puff pastry. Puff pastry, yeah. And it's got like a sweetness to it. It does, oh, which is good. delicious. Yeah, she, she, it's almost like she knows what she's doing down there. It looks incredible. <laughs> she's making us look bad. That's yeah, for sure. I know. <laughs> Man, trying to make this at home and it looked like a, a mess. Mm-hmm. That's delicious. Mm. But it holds up so well to the It does. The wine it's, it's rich enough. Um, it has enough acid to cut through it that nothing seems flabby. You know, they they play off each other really well. Mm-hmm. No, yeah. I love that. I love that pairing. Another question just came in while you guys are Shabby stuffing your faces. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, what makes the Chardonnay taste buttery? Uh, the buttery component of Chardonnay, when the wine is young, tends to be a little bit uh, suppressed and hidden, and as the wine ages, it comes out. And that buttery component is a byproduct of malolactic fermentation. So the malolactic fermentation is a secondary fermentation. It softens the acidity in the wine by converting the green malic acid. If you think of like the acid you get from an apple, which is green and hard to a lactic acid, which is the acid you see in yogurt, so it's softer and rounder. Yeah. But a byproduct of that is you get diacetyl, which is the flavor of butter. And it tends to bind uh, with a little bit of sulfur dioxide in the wine. And so it's hidden when the wine's young, but it comes out as the wine ages. So it's a byproduct of malactic fermentation, and that's how we get that buttery flavor in the wine. Well, thanks that, Richie. But you know what? It's time to go to the next, <laughs> next one, <laughs> which looks delicious. With and scallops. Well, I think I think good, with scallops. I good think to we, know I don't need to cook we, dinner tonight. Should we probably do the Buckley Station with the scallops? Oh what yes, yes, oh, def- yeah, absolutely, good, absolutely. Right. Time to work <laughs> the garden again. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. Healthy garden down there. So seed scallops is this was my choice. Um, two of my favorite pairings for any Rombauer Chardonnay because of the balance of the wine, the way we uh, get enough acidity into it is either uh, some lobster based dish or scallops. And tonight we have a seared scallop with a corn sweet corn salad. Yeah. Um, but I mean, you could do the scallops on almost anything with yeah. rumbash. I mean, you I could do I, it on a risotto. The risotto or would be one of my a choices. White risotto. Yeah. So or these a, were cooked then, on our grill downstairs. You, you know, you could do heartier options in the winter with you know mashed potatoes, um, you know butternut squash puree, um, something just a little bit heartier, richer for the winter. I highly but, recommend putting the lemon on because yeah. quite often Buckley Station gets this lemon zest component in the background, and I think it would be. You know, you guys like to geek out, but you know, I, if I was on the camera, I would slam this down right now. It's really good. The buckling? Yeah. And yeah, it's a really and, good bottle. And the scallops and the... Yeah. Everything. Actually, anything, yeah. a comment from my wife, anything with pastry and rombau chardonnay uh, pairs yes. beautifully. Delicious. Yes. Wow, it really makes the acid stand out. Um, well, it, it helps keep the, the dish like fresh and light. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, scallops have a richness to them. But, but definitely without do. being overbearing, you know, the, the the higher acid buckley really cuts through it, and it makes the, the I mean, it makes like a perfect summer dish. Yeah. It's delicious. What about if it's not summer, Andrew? As you take a, a mouthful yeah, of food, so, I'm like a waiter. You mm-hmm. know, how's your meal, sir? Oh, yeah, delicious. Yeah, no, I mean, so that's when we go back it? to that risotto yeah. and mashed potatoes. You know, those heartier kind of options. Um, you know, and I would I would love with some parmesan, of course, but can't get away from it. <laughs> Uh, all right, you know yeah. what? Actually, no. one of my favorite pairings uh, with the classic Chardonnay, yep. I had it at uh, the kitchen in Sacramento. It was a lobster mac and cheese. Oh, yeah, that'd be just that. It's, I mean, it's basically pure decadence. So, right? as, a, as a lush, you would probably put the scallops on top of that. I would, and yes. And you have scallops <laughs> on top of lobster mac and cheese mm-hmm. with maybe some like langusings layered on top. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Oh. Oh. All right, right so you, we've gone, we're all still eating our entree. I feel yeah, like yeah. we're being rushed through this by our production team at the moment. We just want to sit here and eat. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, you know what? It's my favorite is dessert. I love dessert. 
Um, nothing better than uh, strawberry oh, yeah, shortcake. Look at these. I know it's uh, my wife's Kristen's favorite. Some of this and some Chardonnay would be oh, awesome. This is, uh, look yeah, look at this. We have a whole so, restaurant over here. Yeah, it's, um, so, yeah. okay, of, of the four Chardonnays, Luke, being the dessert expert, the sweetest tooth on the winemaking mm. team by far, what, what would be your uh, pairing of the four classic Chardonnays we're tasting so uh, far? Well, while, I, while I tuck yeah, into dessert. You can't, you can't go wrong without the classic, you know. The classic Chardonnay? It. You know, it's so complex. It's got all those layers from Sonoma, Carneros, Napa Carneros, and all those vineyards. It just helps hold up, even cut oh, yeah. through the, the butter. Oh, not the butter, the cream yep. and strawberry and stuff. Just a little splash. Yeah, that's yeah, no, perfect. Don't be greedy. Yeah, I know. Well, because, <laughs> you know, what else goes with dessert other than just I know. Chardonnay? It's delicious Chardonnay. Is more Chardonnay. Um, but let me try this and how this, this works out. And then uh, maybe we've got something else, Richie, after mm -hmm. this. Um, it's interesting. It changes uh, the flavor of the Chardonnay, the sweetness of the strawberries and the, that, this little sweet vanilla cream. Yeah. It really makes the Chardonnay very crisp and light and lively on the palate. Well, I think it, like, it plays with a little bit of the spice as well. On yeah, the, absolutely. Like, that, like, the, it really the, brings it out the, because you're, you're the getting your The spiciness from that French oak component. Yeah. No, it's it's delicious. Mm. It's such a unique. You know, Andrew, I was thinking, yeah, I mean, there's oh, something what, else. Right? What other Chardonnay would go well with this? Uh, I think it would be this unique Chardonnay. So what's that, just, that you got there? It just popped out. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Magic. One of, uh, so one of our joy. viewers. One of our viewers, uh, Meg Lang Smith, keeps telling us to stop throwing Chardonnay away. Yeah. Uh, we have to because if we drink all of it, we just start talking way too much and yeah. it becomes. And we're yeah. 40 minutes away we, from home. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we have to control our consumption just a little bit uh, so we can get through the yeah, show. I mean, with dessert, I think we've got to. Sorry, water the ground again. Yeah. But what, what do you got? You got some. So this is, this is our 2021 Joy. It's our, our late harvest Chardonnay. So this is uh, you know, a dessert that wine. Mean, late so it's a, it's, based, it's a dessert wine. So we're we're picking really late, um, and then we're having you know it's lower alcohol but higher sugar. Yep. Um, and it's really you know a, a unctuous, really thick, uh, concentrated dessert wine. And so this is the the 2021 Joy. And someone asked about it earlier. Would we be would we be tasting Joy? Yeah. And here it is. So Botrytis wines, sort of the classic style, is Saturns from Bordeaux. And that's uh, made from Semillon. Uh, Semillon has a very thin skin, so Botrytis tends to spread very quickly. Chardonnay has a thicker skin. It's higher in phenolics, so it's harder to get Botrytis to grow. And Botrytis is a mold that grows on the grapes. It's often called noble rot. Um, if you have the right conditions where you have a, a warm, or sorry, a misty, humid morning with lots of moisture, the mold grows under the skins of the grapes. And if you have a warm sunny afternoon, as it dries out, it sporulates and those spores come out and they pierce the skin. When they pierce the skin, it allows that berry to start dehydrating and it concentrates uh, all the sugar and acid down further. And so you end up with a very, very high wine. I think this particular vintage, if you think about Chardonnay, we pick anywhere from 23 to 25 yeah. bricks on, on average. Yep. Uh, what was this 46? 46, 46, 46 40, bricks. Almost 47. So almost. That actually says 46.7. Yeah. Oh, there you go. It was on the bottle. We got it <laughs> right before. <laughs> so it's about twice as sweet as, uh, or twice as much sugar when we pick it in the juice as a normal Rombau Chardonnay. With all that sugar, it's really hard to get it to ferment. It's too what we it's, it's too high osmo tolerance for the yeast. There's to get not really enough water, water in in the yeah, solution. Yeah, so the yeast struggle, and they can only ferment it to a point, and then they give up. And, uh, That's not science. They yeah, really. They, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> they leave a lot of sugar behind. Talk so about you, dribbling. Yeah. So I mean, so this <laughs> this only you know, uh, Chardonnay ferments to about fourteen and a half percent alcohol. Yeah. This is only seven and a half percent. So it, you're starting at a much higher level of sugar. You're only fermenting a little bit. So you're still left with you know, I mean, it's it's. I mean, the, you like can see. I mean, you can see that the. What's the residual sugar on it? Was it like two hundred grams? Yeah. Two hundred grams per liter. Well, so about remember. normal Chardonnay juice. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I mean, right when you start. Yeah. Also, like on the nose though, like even though it's Chardonnay, it, it smells totally different. It does. It's uh, a little bit nutty, yeah, So it has a, a rich lychee, uh, um, toasted almond, toasted almond, like a, like a roasted nut character to it, which yeah. is purely from the Botrytis. You get that uh, caramelized like, fruits. Like, it's like that orange peach or marmalade. Yeah. Orange marmalade mm. is, is a good one. Like it's a, it's like concentrated cooked down. Ripe fruits. But once we get that juice into the winery, it's a very slow press cycle. So it takes several hours to press, uh, about eight hours, whereas yeah. a regular Chardonnay press is about an hour and a half. Yeah. And once we have that juice, we do something special with it. 
Yeah, so we, we press it to tank, let it settle for a while, and then when we go to inoculate it and start the fermentation, we barrel ferment it, but we barrel ferment in freshly toasted barrels. So that morning, all the, it's all American oak. It's all freshly toasted. They're delivered to the winery later that morning, basically midday, and then we fill the juice still into those warm barrels. So it's like that you know, fresh bread versus stale bread. You're incorporating this like freshness and that warmth of the barrel into that juice, and so you're getting this this incredible extraction but concentration um you know it's, it's just a, a really neat thing to be able to do being that close keep to keep talking i'm eating yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm being close to that cooper <laughs> and having those freshly delivered because it's it's very unique that you see that yeah um you know and i was thinking you know something unique that i think you could do with it i really you, hope you do you, do it if you want to want to spare too much of it is just like a little d d dollop <laughs> and it just adds that you know it's like adding balsamic to the end of a dish yeah. adding you know the joy at the end of a dessert. I mean, it's as long as you're extra in the joy then. Because yeah. we're getting lots of comments about how much wine we're throwing in the garden. That's yeah. why yeah. the flowers and the view look so nice. Well, <laughs> and, you know, with, with desserts, you know, strawberry shortcake, yeah. this is this is great. Um, but what else would you like joy with? Ooh, ice you, cream, vanilla bean ice cream. Oh, right. Yeah, see, right over yeah, on top of jam. that. Uh, I'm a little oh, more joy. decadent than the two of you. Yeah. yeah. And uh, my favorite pairing is a very classic pairing that you have with Saturns, which is foie gras. So this particular wine, it's breakfast, lunch, dinner, yeah. every course. But foie gras and a dessert wine for me is, uh, it's always a good night. See, these, these are enjoyable dishes. Richie's are like, work it down. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> like total lush. <laughs> but they're, I mean, it's, it's incredible. But so, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, interesting because it has, it does have a lot of sugar, but it has enough acid to balance it, so it never seems heavy. Yeah. It doesn't cloy because yeah. when you concentrate that sugar down with the botrytis dehydrating the berries, it doesn't just concentrate the sugar, it's also the acid and the flavor. Mm -hmm. So it still has that freshness and liveliness on the palate. Yeah. yeah. No, for sure. And I, I mean, I would, I love creme brulee, so I would love it with creme brulee. Yeah. Baked um, peaches. And it's or, also, uh, yeah, oh, baked peaches would be. Would be awesome. I, I could blue go with that. Cheese, blue cheese, blue cheese would work. Yeah, yeah. silly <laughs> alliance. Well, yeah, yeah, we get a little bit of savoriness as well. Uh, but before I forget, it's also available at rombauer.com um, because it is a wine we you it know was just released. Yeah. Since I've been here, 2010, we've only made it uh, three times. Really? Um, it's only been three. Yeah. So I started in 10. I think we made it in nine. And then we made it in 15, 15 18, 18, and 21. Yeah, 21. So it, it, it's really so vintage specific to having the right conditions. It really is like one of the most special wines we make. Interestingly enough, uh, this particular vintage, the 21, was the smallest vintage uh, yeah. we ever had of Joy. We are, uh, it was a very, very small production. So get it while you can. <laughs> I'll put it that way. <laughs> Not a lot of Joy that year. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, well, that joke. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting to the end of the show, so um, the next show will be uh, November 17th at 5 p.m. Um, it'll be fun. It'll be actually Andrew's favorite wine, the Zinfandel. Can't wait. You we'll know, be doing, we'll uh, be hopefully wrapped up with Harvest. I hope so. I, I can look back and, and talk about it as well as go over my Zins. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully, they got some Fiddletown. So I'm, uh, we'll, we'll do all oh, of yeah. our Zinfandels. It'll be the new release, the 2020s. It'll be a lot of fun. Um, and yeah, we'll be talking all things Zinfandel. So I hope you guys uh, had fun. Sorry for the few little technical difficulties of the videos. They'll be available on our webpage and on our YouTube channel. And we will see you all again at the next Rombauer Hour on November 17th. Yeah. Cheers to Harvest. Cheers, Cheers to Harvest. Thanks.